friend, I extend a warm welcome to you as well. The vice principals of the college, the coordinator, other faculty members, and young students who have come from the collegiate section, as well as from the schools and the higher secondaries, and the faculties who have accompanied them. A warm welcome to all of you. We are extremely happy to host this public lecture titled, Viewing the Earth from Space, Benefits for Humanity, as part of the 22nd National Space Science Symposium. And this symposium seeks to bridge the gap between space science, technology, and society. This talk, this series of talks, yesterday we had one at the Goa University. These series of talks are organized by the Goa University in collaboration with ISRO, Indian Space Science Organization. And we are happy to host this particular talk in our college. The purpose is very prominent. The purpose is to ensure that the school students, the students from the higher secondaries, and the students from the college have access to top level interactions. And I'm sure with this title and having a short interaction, having had a short interaction with Dr. Shailesh Naik, I'm sure he's going to take you up in the sky and leave you in that fascinating world. With those words, I once again welcome all of you on behalf of the college, on behalf of the college, a warm welcome once again to our chief guest, as well as the guest speaker, and all of you who have gathered here. I'm sure this one hour of investment of time will be an investment in your future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that warm welcome. I'm greatly honored to have the opportunity to tell you a little more about our chief guest for the day. As our principal has already mentioned, she is a star of Sankli College, as he says. But a little more about her. She has been teaching since 2004. She's a chemistry teacher at Sri Shantadurga High Secondary School, Picholi. She's also a former member of the Board of Studies for Chemistry and serves as the president of the Association of Chemistry Teachers of Goa. Mrs. Savant has actively engaged in politics contributing to the Bharatiya Janta Party in diverse roles. She has served as the president of BJP Maila Murcha, Prabari of the Maila Murcha Goa Pradesh, and holds the position of state executive member of the BJP in Goa. Her expertise, of course, goes beyond this and also extends to roles in healthcare and social service organizations. As you might have guessed, this list is only the tip of the many accolades that she has to her name. So we are very glad to have such a distinguished personality with us today. Ma'am, may I invite you to address the gathering? A very good evening to the August gathering. And uh, we are here for a lecture series which has been going on, and especially been organized by National Space Science Symposium 2024. And uh, the topic of the day is uh, weaving the earth from the space, benefits for the humanity. And we have our uh, special resource person who has come all the way uh, from National Institute of Advanced Studies, and who is also uh, a former secretary of Ministry of uh, Earth Sciences, Dr. Shailesh Naikji. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Gavazio Mendes, for that uh, kind introduction. And always, actually, he inspires me a lot. 
and especially mentioning me as the alumni of Government College of uh, Sankli because that gives me more responsibility to work uh, towards the college and towards the education also. I will not be uh, speaking um, uh, for a long period because I suppose we have all been gathered over here for a one hour beautiful talk which will be given by Dr. Shailesh Nayakji. And uh, I was just talking to Sir and uh, I was trying to correlate with the topic which has been assigned. So the topic was that weaving the earth from the space and benefits for humanity. And I happen to know that sir is from earth sciences. So uh, rather from the space, but then we are going to go inside the earth crust rather. So because earth sciences all believes uh, in uh, knowing about uh, uh, the uh, structure, uh, how this beautiful planet has been made up of, and thus we exploring the extraterrestrial areas wherein, uh, you know, it's possible for us to have life on the other uh, planets also, and thus there are the various missions which are been carried out. Uh, I believe that uh, today is a great day. Why? Because uh, at Vikrambai Saravai uh, uh, Space Center, today itself our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji had inaugurated Gaganyaan 1. So there are various missions which have been going on, and uh, Gaganyaan 1 will be, uh, you know, something which is going to set a note, and uh, of course it is going to bring us in a line with America or that of China and Russia, and our country will be the next one. There are altogether 625 people, astronauts, who have gone to the space. Mind you, all these 625 are from these three countries, that is US and uh, that of Russia and that of uh, uh, China. But now India will be the next one who is going to take its uh, jump to the space, and we will have our Gaganyaan 1 mission, which will be taking four astronauts to the space. Today itself if we go to find out about it, Gaganyaan 1 is a mission which is going to take four of our astronauts and this mission will be done in the period of 2024 to 2025. Of course, with the great success of Chandrayaan 3 and that of Aditya L1 that we had recently and uh, now we are moving ahead with Gaganyaan 1 which will be a first spacecraft which will be taking a crew of four astronauts to the space at a height of almost 400 kilometers away from the Earth. So I believe this requires a great round of applause for all these four people who are uh, actually representing the, uh, the Indians. The, they are inspiring so many Indians and they are inspiring so many of your, you students who can think of that, yes, it's possible in this new India. Yes, this is possible in Vikasit Bharat 20. 47 and we will make it possible. Uh, I think uh, that with that note I will wind up my uh, talk because we all are waiting for uh, Sir's uh, special uh, address on this particular occasion. So thank you so very much uh, uh, to Sir Javazu Mendes for having me over here and yes, <laughs> thank you so very much everybody. Indeed, our country is on the path of greatness, and our scientists are certainly continue to inspire us every single day. Thank you, ma'am, for bringing, us, bringing that reminder back to us. For having two erudite speakers here with us and for gracing us on this occasion with their presence, we are indeed grateful. To showcase our appreciation, I would like to request our principal to present a memento to Mrs. Selakshana Savant. And of course, for taking the time to now enrich us with this promising lecture that we have ahead of us. We are grateful to Dr. Sailesh Nayak for being here. On behalf of Goa University, I would like to request Mrs. Sulakshana Savan to present a memento to our guest speaker. <laughs> Kindly give them a round of applause. And on behalf of Government College, of Sankeli, 
I request our principal to present a memento as an acknowledgement of our appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Shailesh Nayak. The memento that Government College Sankli would like to give to our guest speaker comes from our heart. And when I say it comes from our heart, it is a portrait, a pencil portrait of the guest speaker. We in our college are brimming with talent. And this has been done by one of our students. And this comes, sir, with a lot of love and appreciation that we would like to keep our bonds of uh, linkage with you continuing. Thank you to all of our dignitaries. All right, we will, uh, our chief guest would now be leaving us and would be, uh, as she has other commitments that she would have to get to. So we thank her for her presence once again. Could we please put our hands together for her? In 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface and declared that it was one small step for man, but a great leap for mankind. Since then, the boundaries of space exploration have increased tenfold. The last four to five years itself have witnessed the discovery of new moons, massive comets that were previously undetected, a series of solar outbursts that triggered large geomagnetic storms, and this list only continues to expand. Serving as a reminder about how vast space is, and yet at the same time, how limited our knowledge continues to be. Which is why we are incredibly lucky to have this opportunity to listen to this lecture on viewing the Earth from space, the benefits for humanity. I invite the coordinator of today's program, Dr. Sufala Pujari, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Zoology and the director of the College Research and Development Cell to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Respected dignitaries on the days, this is person for today, Dr. Shailish Nayak, uh, our principal, Professor Jervasio Mandis, sir, other dignitaries of the days, students, members of the public. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you all this person for today, Dr. Shailish Nayak. He's currently the director of the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. Chancellor of Terry School of Advanced Studies, Delhi, Editor-in-Chief, Journal of the Indian Society of Remote Sensing, and Life Trustee, India International Center, New Delhi. Dr. Nayak obtained PhD degree in geology from the MS University of Baroda in 1980. He was the Secretary to Government of India for the Ministry of Earth Sciences between August 2008 to 2015. He provided leadership for the programs related to the Earth System Science. At Earth System Science Organization, Indian National Center for Ocean Information Service, he set up a state-of-the-art early warning system for tsunami and storm surges in the Indian Ocean and developed a marine GIS for improving advisory services related to potential fishing zones, ocean state forecast, and Indian agro project during 2006 to 2008. He had joined the Space Application Center, Indian Space Research Organization, in 1978 as a scientist. He led coastal and ocean color research. His current research interest includes building strategy for the blue economy, sustainable development, and science diplomacy. He has published about 200 papers in SEI journals. Dr. Nayak is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bengaluru, 
the National Academy of Sciences, India, Allahabad, the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, and Academician of the International Academy of Astronautics, Paris. Considering the impact of his research on the society, the Government of India has conferred him the civilian honor Padma Shri in the field of science and engineering 2024. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I request you to give a big round of applause to Sir. Yeah. So, presenting before you, Padma Shri, Dr. Shailesh Nayak. Sir, may I request you to kindly begin with your lecture? I request our principal, Sir, to kindly occupy this space in the audience. Thank you very much uh, for very generous introduction. Professor Mandis, principal of the college, my dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really my pleasure to come back here again after three, four years. I came here uh, for the Manohar Parikar lecture series some four, five years back. So this is really very hard well, uh, thanks to all of you. Last time also a lot of students were there and I see the lot of students. So it's really my pleasure to be here. You must have all have studied uh, either in environmental science or in geography, the different interactions uh, which are taking place. You must be all aware about uh, monsoon. The sun energy hits up the ocean and then water vapor goes up, which forms the clouds. The wind takes that clouds to the land. The, then the rainfall comes. And the water, again, through streams and river, goes back to ocean. So this is, there are several such kind of the interaction where more than one component. So Earth has the ocean or a hydrosphere, atmosphere, the biosphere, the fauna, flora, the snow and ice, which we call as a cryosphere, and the geosphere. So there are interactions of different type, as you can see in this figure. Now, these processes are very important to understand the, what all happens in the Earth. Now, this interaction, what we call as a one unit, the Earth is seen as a single unit, and then there are different components. And Now, this knowledge actually came when the satellites were launched. Till then, we were not viewing that there may be many global processes. So, the satellite provided a picture which is of the complete Earth, which you might all have must have seen, and this allowed us to find out how this interaction and the feedback from that affects the various processes. And the most important, which we have seen in last 150 years, how our own activities affect these processes or these processes affect our activities, which we call now as a climate change, which we have been all experiencing, and which is essentially because of the interfering the natural processes with the anthropogenic processes. So the earth system science, what we call, is a, one of course is a science. It involves the physics, chemistry, biology, geology, everything. The space, because what we try to do is from the space. And since it is deal with the society, it is the social science, economics, and cognition. So the earth science brings different aspects of the different subjects and the, we try to understand that in the world in which we live, how it is functions and why the sustainability is so much important. Now, early 
before the satellites came, the earth science was most, mostly geology, the, how the mountains have formed. Many of you might have heard about plate tectonics or the oceans have formed, how the continent moved from one place to the other. So this was mostly a part of the geology. In last two centuries, 19th and 20th centuries, the biology came into much more important. And we have seen that the impact of the biology or the humans on the how it has changed the earth and how it has impacted the life. The satellites in 60s, the first satellite was a uh, after Sputnik, the meteorological satellites, provided the synoptic cover of the entire earth. Not only that, we were able to view the earth in a different periods. <coughs> like today, <coughs> our uh, inside satellites views the one third of the earth every 15 minutes. So you try to understand the what happens in different times, how the wind changes, how the temperature changes, how the many other processes which changes. So it allowed us to observe and measure the various things. And that is why this is very important. Now, the importance of earth science came in 90s and they we try understood that the human being, how human being has been impacting this and how the geoscience and the biology is useful to understand the global change. And that is why India was first country to set up a separate ministry of the Ministry of Earth Science in 2007, saying that this is nationally very important to understand the Earth system, not only for India as a whole, but to the globe as such. Now, there are a few things which I will give you some examples, but there are a few things which we must keep in mind, which are the fundamental thing in the Earth system science. One is the variability. That means these processes can vary within few minutes to millions of years. So the time scale is very large, both in time and space, it could be very small or it may be a global process. So this understanding of this process, the measurement which is done through satellite now assimilated into the models to understand and predict the future behavior. So this variability which tried to understand mostly came from the satellite because it provided very repetitive coverage of the earth. The other is the biological process has been saying, which is very important, and that is a, another important part of the earth system. Now, these processes are also occur laterally as well as the vertically. So right from the atmosphere to the deep of the earth to the uh, horizontally or laterally. So there are scales are quite large from a very small scale, local scale to regional scale to the global scale. And the most important is these processes are non-linear. So even the small change can bring a large amount of if the threshold is crossed. And that is why when the many of you must be knowing that the threshold kept at 1.5 degree centigrade or a two degree, beyond that any change, can bring a dramatic changes into the Earth system. So that is why this number is very critical. Now what I will do is, I will give you a few examples. The first is, as you know, about the natural hazards. Cyclones is one which is uh, 25 years back in Orissa. We lost more than 10,000 people when the cyclone came. And now you have been seeing that the amount of lives lost is drastically reduced. Now, how this has happened? It has happened because of various things, but one of the most important thing happened is the observation from the satellites. The radars were able to see about 300, 400 kilometers from the coast. 
But the satellite provided first time the what happens in the ocean, how the temperature is changing, and that give that the understanding of the genesis of the uh, cyclone. And we are able to monitor, you must have seen that the satellite, INSAT and many other satellite, how the satellite, uh, the satellite track the cyclone, how it is moving. So it's tracking, it's land for points. All these observations actually put into model to find the, the kind of uh, track which you see. Uh, and you can see that the track which is predicted and the observed is more or less same. So the satellite provided a lot of accuracy. And apart from the observations like INSAT, there are many other information which is required in the model about that, as I told you, different components. So you need information about the atmosphere, temperature, humidity, wind, and then you need also the information about the ocean depth, how the temperature and salinity is changing. Also, you need information about the surface, sea surface, how it is changing. So all this information is collected, assimilated, and then you get a very accurate predictions. So this has helped not only to us, but today India is providing this cyclone forecast to all countries in the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. And it is now a regional center of World Meteorological Organization to provide this. Now, still there are a lot of new research is being done. As I told you that we use the temperature and humidity profile, but the wind profiles are still not available. So this is another thing which is we try to understand. And the most important thing is that the information which is available through the forecast and the response of the state government, national government, the local government is exemplary because they know that whatever forecast is given is reliable and accurate. So the evacuation of the people or this is all, the entire system is in place. And that is why we see that during all such cases, the lives lost has been drastically reduced. And this is one of the most important aspect of the combination of the satellite or the space science and the earth science. <coughs> the second, which is very important example is on the tsunami. You must have all heard India lost about 25,000 people during the tsunami. And that time, we did not have any warning system. So the government of India decided that we need to build the tsunami warning system. And they also realized that we need to understand the Earth as a total system. So they set it up the Ministry of Earth Sciences. And the tsunami warning system has been set up. Now here, the, it is, what we are doing is earthquake based and there are models have been built which gives you that what time it will take to reach to the mainland and what would be the height. So depending upon the where the earthquake has occurred and you can see that one zone the Andaman Nicobar and the Indonesia, and one is the Makran coast on the Pakistan. There are two tsunami genic zones where if earthquake occurs can generate a tsunami. So this kind of models have been built to find out in any of this place, if there is a tsunami, we would be able to know well in advance. And this depends on finding out the, where earthquake has occurred how much sea level is changing in the mid sea and along the coast. All this information is 24 by seven is processed. And then this kind of models are used to find out. And this information is conveyed back to all 22 countries in the Indian Ocean. Now, all this, before we did this, the Pacific Tsunami Warning System was giving a general warning, that means the Bay of Bengal can have a tsunami. We did a innovation and we are giving location specific uh, warning. That means every 50 kilometer, 
distance, we will give one forecast. So we have 1,800 forecasts for any earthquake occurring. And all this, we do it in six minutes. And there is no human intervention. The everything from collection of the data to the advisory which goes to the concerned people is completely automated. We are talking now the internet of things now, but this was all done as a part of tsunami in 2007, when the computing power was much less. So this is one of the best uh, innovation, and India was first to use this approach, not only to use this approach, but they also shown that this can be really work. And the main advantage in this is the communication. As you see, the time is essential, and the inset provided that uh, platform to uh, collect the information and to provide the advisories. The third, which is very important, is the earthquake. As you know that the Indian plate moves northwards and it generates tremendous amount of stress and strain, and Himalaya is one area where the earthquake occurs. Through satellite, what is the navigation satellite, the GPS and the, our own uh, Indian national uh, navigation system, gives you information about how much stress is being built. And that information is very critical for us to understand. And we now know that the what you can see as a central seismic gap, that is an area where the stress is building up and the earthquake has not occurred there. So this is an area where the earthquake can occur. But we are not able to predict the earthquake. So what is to be done is that in this region, what we say that you have to identify which are the areas are more vulnerable and you develop a infrastructure. That means all public buildings, school, colleges, hospitals, police station, government building should be earthquake resistant and to begin with and then slowly the everything because People die not because of the earthquake, but because of the buildings, if they are not constructed as per the requirement of the to which can withstand the stress. So this is the another area where the satellite provided a very important information where the stress is building up. Now, the new thing which is going to come, the NISAR satellite, which ISRO is going to launch sometime in a few months, is to measure the strain at everywhere. It's a very complex technology called SAR interferometry. You don't worry about that. But that can tell you that where the strain is building up, where the minor changes are occurring, one millimeter, two millimeter kind of a changes. So that we can measure from the satellite, and that will give us understanding about where the possibility of earthquake is. <coughs> now, as I told you that we are unable to predict the earthquake. Now the main reason for the not able to predict the earthquake is that we are not able to see what kind of processes are occurring at the surf below the surface. And this could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 kilometers below the surface. Like cyclone, we are able to do because we are able to observe what is happening. Now, so we have planned an experiment that we will drill a borehole, which is uh, in a Koena, where you know that the earthquakes are occurring for last 50 years, but small earthquakes, 4.5, 5, like that, which is not really very harmful, to go there and measure what kind of changes are occurring. Because before the earthquake, there are, before earthquake, during the earthquake, and after the earthquake, the changes do occur. But we are not able to see that. So this borehole has been drilled up to three kilometers, and it will be taken up to seven kilometers, completely with the indigenous technology. And we are now instrumented the three kilometer borehole, and we are measuring some of the changes. Now, what we found with the current experiment, that in Koina, there cannot be an earthquake greater than 5.8 because we were able to see which are the areas which are getting disturbed. So this is a very important information which has come out, that we need to prepare in this Koina region. All buildings should be able to withstand 
earthquakes is about 6.5, so that there won't be any problem even if the earthquake occurs. And once we can go up to seven and measure all the changes, we would be able to model that how the earthquake is occurring. And this is the experiment many countries have tried, but wherever they have drilled, earthquake is not happening. India, we have been able to drill where the earthquake has been happening and able to measure with three kilometers certain properties, but the firm measurements will happen when exactly we go up to seven kilometer where the earthquakes are occurring. So this is another very unique experiment which India is conducting. You must have all heard about Uttarakhand uh, Rishi Ganga floods. It happened, but nobody exactly knew what happened. So satellites provided, the first time you can see that the first image is on the February 6, where the red circle you can keep uh, seeing, it's all white. So this is all snow and ice. And you can see on 7, that white portion has turned to be a brownish. The all snow and ice has been fallen. And this area is huge. It is about 0.34 square kilometer. So it's a huge area. And that mass fall almost 3,800 meter below. You can see even if you throw one stone in a lake, what kind of uh, waves comes up. <coughs> now, such a huge mass, it falls from a, such a great height, you can see what can happen. So all along, it took all the snow, rocks, everything together for 3.8 kilometer, and that all dumped into the river, and that uh, devastated the power station and a lot of other things. So the satellite provided this information that before, during, and after what has happened. So this is another very important uh, area. The, we could see only through a satellite. The floods also, like urban floods in Chennai, was very rare. And uh, apart from using satellite data for weather forecasting and hydrological modeling and all, but ultimately what you need is which are the areas are going to be inundated. And this provided by very high resolution Cartosat satellite, where you can measure that each ward wise, you can see that each ward wise, which are the areas will be flooded and the what depth or what the height of the water there. So these models are now operational and this is being used to provide relief and rescue in the area. And this is, you can know well in advance, about five to six hours before that what is likely to happen. So this kind of thing is also now put into Bombay and the other cities are, will be happening. <coughs> so this is about hazards. Now weather is another important, and many of you may be seeing that uh, the forecast has improved over a period of time in last decade. Earlier, we used to joke that if uh, IMD prediction that today is going to rain, that means you don't take umbrella. But today, situation is that when they say it will rain, you take the umbrella. Now, this happened because of the various reasons. The first is that the information about the weather, especially about monsoon, is a very critical, and there are different kinds of forecasts which we give. One is seasonal, what will be the onset and what is likely rainfall. You must be all seeing that the forecast is given, it is normal monsoon or above normal or a drought year and all that. The second is you also need a about 10 to 23 weeks time, the what is likely to happen, and the short term, which you are all very familiar, that next three to five days, what is going to happen. Now this is, we have improved drastically by using the models and assimilating large amount of satellite data. We are assimilating almost 500 GB data every six hourly. So the model is run four times in a day to provide this information. And the 
initial condition what we say is coming from the satellite, different kinds of satellite, not only Indian, but the entire, there are actually 48 satellite data is assimilated into the models to provide this forecast. Now, what is the advantage of this to people? The one, there are many applications, but the most important is the on the agriculture, and there are 40 million farmers, so what is provided to them is a rainfall, maximum minimum temperature, cloud cover, humidity and wind, which are very critical for various uh, operations, like when to do sowing, or when the irrigation is to be applied, when the, what kind of a crop to be chosen, when to fertilize or pesticides to be applied. So all this information is very critical. So there is a bi-weekly forecast is given on these parameters to the farmers, which is called agrometeorological services. And this is given at a block level. And so the, when farmer knows that it is going to rain, they can apply the fertilizer. But if they apply pesticides and it rains, then it all got wasted. So they have to apply the pesticide when it is not going to rain. So, or when to do plowing. Plowing, if they do and there is no rain, then they can't do the sowing. So all these uh, applications, it found that the total benefit which is coming to farmer is about 10,000 crore every year, which is quite large compared to the investment which we make into the satellite. So apart from that, the productivity of the farmer also goes up and their economic conditions also improve. So the improved weather forecast has several advantage, not only in agriculture, but also in the power, uh, the uh, floods, and many other, like civil aviation. All, there are 30 different sectors where uses the weather forecast. And the improvement came because of the large use of the satellite and using the more models. Now the other area which is uh, on the coastal and ocean and Goa is mostly uh, dependent on the ocean for a variety of things. So the one which is very important like farmers is the fishermen, the where they are going to get fish. Now normally they go on searching and the search time was quite high. So we have now developed a method by which is a very, in a simple terms, if I say, the two parameters, one is the environment in the ocean, which is defined by the temperature. We also define how today is hot or wet, whether you like, so the fauna in the, also depends on the kind of a temperature. So one is the temperature. Second is the food availability, which is done from the chlorophyll. So both these information comes from the satellites. And now we have added the sea surface height for currents and many other things. So this forecast is given to the fishermen and now they are finding that there is a drastic, about 80% reduction in their search time and their catch has increased 60 to 80, 70%. So <coughs> the time is reduced the fuel is reduced, so the catching per unit effort has improved. Now many are arguing that you are, this may lead to excess catch by the fisherman. But those who are familiar with the fisher, the, each boat cannot carry more than what is available. And this uh, service is available for last 20 years. The catch has not increased but the effort to put the same catch has reduced. And we are still uh, fishing in the biological limits. So there is no overfishing, but the effort has reduced and the advantage to fishermen for per trip, they get about 17,500 rupees additional. So there is a lot of economic benefit coming. And this service is now upgraded with the putting the other satellite data, the, navi the navigation satellite data, so they would know where exactly they are, whether they have crossed the boundary to Sri Lanka or Pakistan, and also the information about 
the if cyclone is coming or tsunami is coming or any other emergency can be given to them through this Navi. So this service is extremely useful and today more than 90% of fishermen uses this information. Now, the other thing is that if we want continue to do this, we must know what is likely stock of the fish. You must be all aware that the government of India gives a forecast that this year wheat production will be 180 million tons or rice this many million tons before harvest. So that, that is based on certain models and uh, same thing we are now trying to do for the fish. That a particular fish, a sardine or a mackerel, what is likely stock available for the mackerel or a sardine? Now how you can do that? We know that the different, this uh, is controlled by physical, biological and chemical processes which is essentially lead to understanding about how the temperature and color change. You can see in this figure, the top figure is of a temperature and the bottom figure of the uh, chlorophyll. You can see when the green along the coast is increasing, the red also increases. That is what we call as the upwelling. That means the bottom water is coming up, which brings a lot of nutrients, and that nutrients feeds the uh, pelagic fishery, especially sardine and mackerel. So this is kind of a models which are now trying to build so that the annual stock size of a particular fishery can be predicted. And then you can plan that this much only should be fish. So this is another major application which is currently in a research domain, but we are sure that in few years this would be operationalized. The other is the coastal ecosystems. You must be seeing the mangroves all along the Goa coast and along the Indian coast. This is very important because they provide a certain functions, uh, what we call as a ecosystem services. All the mangroves or a coral reefs or a, uh, sea grasses provide certain ecosystem services. Now what are those services? One is provisioning which provides the food, the fish, selfish, uh, many edible biota and all that, fodder, fuel. Also, they regulate certain services because the, like uh, you know that if there is a vegetation, the areas where there is a mangrove, the waves attenuate much faster than the areas which are barren of the vegetation. The waves can come much more inside. Or supporting service like primary secondary production actually the liter which falls on the sea uh, they provide also nutrients which increases the primary and secondary production the carbon sequestration cultural service like tourism beach research so these all services are possible with the this ecosystem service now what we don't know is what is the economic value of these services. We know about fisheries, that this is the, uh, this much production of fish, but how do we put a value to, uh, say, beach tourism or carbon sequestration or to recycling of nutrients? How do we put? So this is an area where the current research is going on that how do we provide the economic value to these uh, services. Now why this is important is, you can see that area under mangroves. There are some places there is a reduction, but you can see all over India, it is increased. And it is increased in last 20 years from 4,000 to about 5,000 square kilometer. Now how do this information came? You know, the Forest Survey of India started mapping the mangroves from 1987. So last more than 25 years of data is there. And that tells us that how the things have been changing. Every two years, the entire forest cover on the land as well as on the coast is mapped using satellite data. So this is one of the most important uh, application. And today we know that the Total carbon stock in the mangroves is about 52.5 million tons. Now this can be converted into an economic value. 
Of course, it has not been done, but it is possible. So this services, which I mentioned, is now improved based on the data which is now provided by the satellite that though there may be some ups and downs, but you can see that the most important is on Gujarat and Maharashtra, which is most industrialized states, the mangroves have increased. So it is not that industry can uh, destroy the mangroves. It is more important that how both can be put together to uh, get the benefit of the ecosystem as well as the industrialization. So there are, this knowledge is important to plan the different developmental activities. Of course, the fisheries I told, uh, the other, second is the coral reef. We know now that the, what kind of uh, corals are there, how much changes, and you can see that the most coral reefs are in a healthy condition, but there are significant amount of uh, degraded reefs also. But this we know. So we have can plan conservation measures for this area so that we continue to get the ecosystem services. Now, here, the information about the coral reefs, there are different types of coral reefs, soft corals, hard corals, and we are in a position to distinguish them, even if it is the below the water. And we use uh, hyperspectral data, that means the it is viewed in a very narrow bandwidth, 10 nanometer bandwidth in a blue, green, so that we know what are the different kinds of corals are there. So this is a very important thing, and we can also see whether they are bleached or not. And we can also see, if you take the repetitive coverage, that what happens to the bleached reef. And what we found in some of the cases is that the area which is bleached once do not get bleached in the second. That means they also adapt to the higher temperature. Once it, so, and the next, which is uh, next uh, when the uh, high temperature comes, some other beaches get. Soft corals are more vulnerable than the hard corals. So many such information has been coming out. But <coughs> those who are biology, they know there is a symbiotic relationship between algae and the uh, corals. So we don't know exactly whether it is algae which is adapting to the higher temperature or the corals. Because if algae is not able to adapt to the higher temperature, the food is not there, the coral will anyway die. So this is an area of a research which some of you can definitely think and can take it up. Now, all this information about the coast, there is a lot of information is, uh, and today in India, the coastal zone management plans are made entirely using the satellite data. And this is legally accepted by the Supreme Court. This is the one case where the entire management plans and the National Center for uh, Sustainable Coastal Management of Ministry of Environment and Forest has prepared the entire country's maps. The initial, the methodology was developed by the SAC in 90s, and this is now being replicated. The entire center does this work. And you can see in this, all the information which is required for managing the coast is available from the satellites. So this is another major application, which is actually the, there is a notification, mostly you must be all aware about CRZ in Goa and the Khazan lands and all that. So this all information comes on the satellite very clearly and can be planned appropriately to manage the coast. Many areas are under uh, erosion, you know, I think Varketar Beach, uh, you see the large cliffs and, so this is also now being monitored through satellite. Every year, the National Center for Coastal Research in Chennai monitors the shoreline and where the erosion is occurring, where and what kind of erosion, whether it is high or low, where the, we are gaining the coast or where there is no change. All this information is available to plan what is to be done. There is one example like in Pondicherry, the beach was completely eroded and this you can see in the bottom figure, the beach was there just uh, 
opposite to Chief Secretary's office, completely eroded. And this we came to know from the, of course, on the ground, but the satellite told us what is the extent of this kind of an erosion. And the engineering solution, we have provided a reef, uh, underwater reef, and the beach has come back. So once you have the information, you can respond with the possible engineering solutions. The other in most important thing is when you, for the variety of uh, applications like shipping, port operations, and uh, many other, you need information about the waves and currents and temperature. So this is now provided like weather forecast. This is also six hourly forecasts are provided that what kinds of waves will be there, what kinds of current would be there. And this is being done for the different levels. You know, you can give for a specific port, you can give for a Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean, or the Global Ocean. So this is, India is now providing, and the India is the only country which also provides the validation. The, whatever the forecast is given and what exactly happened is also provided. And we also provide this information to many other countries, including Maldives. Now, the, all this, what is happening on the coast, what we call as the vulnerability. And one of the most important thing to find out vulnerability and what change, I showed you the shoreline change. So we use the shoreline change rate and the slope, which also comes from the satellite, and the coastal geomorphology also comes from the satellite. And the entire Indian coast is mapped to find which are the areas which are vulnerable. So that when you want to make an investment in the coast, and if it is vulnerable, you know what is the additional cost would be required. So this is another major area of using the satellite. Now what we are trying to do is all this information which is collected from satellite, ground and all, to put into a system what we call as a digital ocean. So that, like I can give you example, like satellite measures uh, surface temperature through optical means and the microwave. So, but you can, you need to know only one temperature, so they, they will integrate all this. So this is another which is very useful to integrate different information for the digital ocean. The last is uh, the snow and glaciers, which is, you know all that it is retreating. And, uh, but we don't know exactly where the uh, glaciers were and the satellite provided first time the entire inventory of the Himalaya. How many glaciers are there? And last 40 years, this mapping is done so we know how much you can say that and this most of the glaciers are retreating except in Karakoram area where the glaciers are uh, advancing now within India also the western Himalayas the glaciers are retreating slowly compared to the eastern so all this information is being available by analyzing the satellite data now the important is that area we know, but what is important, as I told you, that how much mass is changing. And so mass change, you also need a depth. So depth is not known. So there are different methods is being used to compute the mass. One is you measure the gravity, which will tell you the mass. The second is you see the, if you know the slope, and if you repeatedly know, you would, can compute the mass. So this is being done, uh, that what is the change in the mass, but this is now not done for the entire Himalaya, but only few glaciers. Only the, with gravity data we could see for the entire Himalaya, and the very staggering number came that we are losing about 4 billion tons of ice annually. It's a huge mass which is being lost. Now, the Arctic. India has also gone to the Arctic and set up their stations, one in Norway called Svalbard, uh, New Ellison, and second they have done in Canada. So many people ask the question that why we should have the, this. The reason is that our monsoon 
is affected by what happens in the Arctic. As I told you that this is a global process, there are teleconnections, so we need to know what is happening in Arctic. So when the Arctic warms up, we may get more monsoon, and when the cold uh, comes, we may get a drought. So this is known by the paleo uh, climate studies. A lot of caves and studies have been done, and we found that the, the second days, when you want to receive the satellite data at Hyderabad, in the visibility, there are three or four orbits only. So you don't get the global data in a real time. So if you have a station in polar regions, you get 10 to 11 uh, stations. So we also need to have a satellite receiving station in Arctic. We already have in Antarctic. So if you have that, you receive the real-time data for the entire globe, which is very critical for us to understand the weather and climate. So that is the another area. In Arctic, there are very critical minerals which we will need when you go to non-renewable, especially for the batteries, the some of the rare earth elements. So Greenland has a huge resource. So that is the another reason that we need to go. Oil and gas is the other. The shipping route is another. So India has now consciously decided to invest in the Arctic and the center, those who have an interest. There is a center, National Center for Ocean, Polar and Ocean Research in Basco. You can see that the kind of work which is being done in Goa itself. The same way the Antarctica is very critical. One is of course for the weather and climate. The second, how the Gondwana breakup and the Indian plate moved northwards. Actually the east coast of India and Antarctica were joined once. So we need to understand how this fragmentation took place. So that is why we also have a research station and a lot of other experiments are done on the physics, chemistry, biology, on the uh, astronom astronomy and many others. And you can see that satellite receiving station on the top and the, our very modern station on the uh, bottom. So this, and this is maintained around the year. I mean, the, even in winter, where the temperature can go as low as minus 60, people do stay there and conduct their experiment. These also you can see in the center in the Vasco and CPOR. Now all this thing which is, as I told you, the different processes. Now we understand the most of the earth system processes. But what we don't understand is how the social system, that means the government policy responds to this knowledge. You have seen that uh, when the Trump came in US, he said, I don't believe in climate change and he withdrew from the Paris Agreement. So though the knowledge was there and mostly the knowledge also came from the West that climate change has become, but the government, the social system refused to respond to that knowledge. So you only having a knowledge is not sufficient. You also need a social system which responds to this knowledge. And the third is the human system or a behavior. Even if the earth system and the social system is in place, if people do not support, then also this won't work. Again, I will give example of a US. The kind of vestige which is happening in US is a very high. Most of you may be when you go from your one room to other room, your mother or father or someone elder will tell you switch off the light. Most Indian families are conscious that we may be, uh, it may be inherent, but the main thing is that we don't use energy unnecessarily. But in the US, you will see that they keep everything on and they will say that we can afford it. Yes, they can afford it, but the price is paid by the entire world. US uses 22% of the energy of the world total, while the population is hardly 5%. So people behavior is equally important, and we all should be conscious 
that how we can save energy or a water or anything. Because all that small, small thing, if one billion people save one unit a day, it is one billion units saved. And that much less carbon dioxide you are putting into the atmosphere. So all the three things is required. But now we are being able to model the Earth system, but how to integrate the social and the human behavior into the model so that we can say that this kind of a system is conducive, this kind of a system is not conducive. That is the work which we have been doing now to bring, build that model where the social and human aspect are added to the science. So with this, thank you very much for very patience hearing. <coughs> I'll be very happy if there are any questions or... You will be moderating or I can speak? We can pass a mic around in case there are any questions that anyone has. Kindly raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Sir, you can have a seat, please. Hello, Chi. Do we have any questions at the back? Sir, you said uh, we are losing uh, glaciers and uh, lots of uh, ice. What is happening then? This, uh, what, what is the impact of this loss? Yeah, actually, this is a very good uh, question. Uh, to be very honest, uh, we don't know. But uh, there is a, a theory what we call as an isostasy. That means if you take load out from somewhere, somewhere it will come up to main the equilibrium. So, and Hello. I believe that some of the changes which are happening in Himalaya, is structural changes, is essentially because of loss of ice, because suddenly you remove that mass. So that much load has reduced here. So it has to get compensated somewhere else. And how it is getting compensated, we don't know. There is a work is going on, and I hope uh, we would uh, know the answer. Same thing is uh, like a groundwater. We are losing groundwater in Northwest India and Northwest uh, US, a large number. Now that mass is removed, and ultimately that mass either goes to the atmosphere or to the ocean. Now, when you have an additional mass in the atmosphere, maybe the more rainfall may come. And if you have additional mass into the ocean, the sea level will rise. So, but exactly this cause and effect is yet not modeled. But I think uh, we need to understand that when you lose this mass, what happens? Because our cur current uh, emphasis on the climate change does not take into account this kind of thing. Similarly, like, we are saying that temperature increases, this will happen. But we don't say if carbon dioxide increases, what happens to the plants? There may be something may be happening, but we don't know what exactly is. So there are many such questions, and that is why I think the earth system science is gaining more and more importance to answer this kind of a questions. So thank you very much, Gopal. Thank you, sir, for your response. Do we have a last question in the audience that we would like to take? Yes. Hello. 
Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening. So, can you please elaborate about particularly like uh, mining, okay? And my point is uh, basically for rare earth materials, okay? Yeah, actually you need a rare earth for the magnets. Uh, it may be very small amount, uh, but you do need it. We do have rare earths, but most of these rare earths are with the uh, monazite and the atomic minerals. Indian lithium mining, okay. Lithium, see, the, we have a lithium, uh, but lithium is uh, not like iron or where you have a very simple uh, mineral. Lithium comes in a very complex. So even if you know that this area has a lithium, to first to how do we extract it? And once you know the process of extracting, you need to set up, and my feeling is though the huge deposits has been reported, not only in Kashmir, also in Afghanistan for several years, the actual mining and extraction and its use, I think it's still several years away. It may take some more time. I don't think immediately we are going to get any lithium out of those deposits. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm here, doctor. Sir, uh, this mangrove provides a lot of services, and uh, like that so many other ecosystems, except the fisheries, valuation is not done about the mangroves. Uh, can it be possible to do it in the near future? Yeah, I think so. Actually, uh, the efforts are already initiated uh, at the National Center for Coastal Research and also in NIAS. Uh, we are trying to understand how we can put a value. So the, actually the economist and ecologist has to sit together. Uh, if alone ecologists try to identify the value, it won't be appropriate. But if both together, I believe that we would be able to do. Long back, uh, we tried to do in uh, some of the areas on the Gujarat uh, uh, by um, Indira, uh, I forgot her name exactly, and they, she came out with uh, some number that about 2,000 crore worth is there. But again, it was a combination, mostly provisioning service, how much fodder or a fish or a fuel, but the other service is not, uh, like carbon sequestration is not valued. But now, I think it should be possible to put a value because there are uh, that they may put a carbon tax or this tax. So there may be a, some way we would be able to identify. And that is why many areas now, actually the Germany and all, they are very keen to support mangrove plantation because they think they will get carbon credit for uh, doing that. So these things are going on. So I'm sure that in near future, we would be able to put a value to this uh, different services. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those concise responses to all of the questions raised. And thank you for enlightening us about the wonders of satellite technology and the ability to map earthquakes, natural hazards, and the changes in the Earth's mass. Indeed, a lot of lives have been saved due to satellite technology and our ability to view the Earth and the changes on the Earth. So we thank you for bringing all of that to the fore in today's public lecture. Um, as we come to the end of this enriching and eye-opening session, I would like to invite Associate Professor from the Department of Chemistry, Ms. Rosalind De Silva, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening, esteemed guests for today, principal sir, 
all the heads of departments, teachers, students, and the public. This was one of the most enriching lectures I've heard. No doubt I'm a chemistry person, sir. You have put a lot of knowledge that our students could relate to in the future. Now they may be young minds, but surely someday they could be our scientists. In a nutshell, for all who are present here, Sir has put forward important features in this lecture. Knowledge of natural processes that cause disasters, but they are natural processes like cyclones, tsunami, and earthquakes. So in a simple manner, if Sir has said these are natural processes, how can the disasters be minimized? Climatic forecast for farmers, especially fishermen, these are the type of uh, occupations that are in need of forecasts. And therefore, all this information can be used for a better tomorrow. Ecosystem services just spoke about valuation. Coastal ecosystem, mangroves, coral reefs, etc. Again, these are the natural sources, resources that we have to take care of. A very important form of relationship that you mentioned, algae and coral reefs. Botany, zoology, geology, chemistry, say it all. It's all there to come together and uh, make something out of it. Coastal zones, vulnerability. The digital ocean. All this is knowledge, that's what Sir said. But it's not enough. What Sir meant was knowledge will be given, but there should be social bodies able to accept the same, understand the same, and take responsibilities for the same. What more could we ask from Sir? All of you and us, this is a lecture that we couldn't miss. And when we have to organize a talk, an occasion, an event, or a program, it's not a one-man show. A lot many hands work together to make it possible. Surely, it goes without saying that a vote of thanks is naturally expected. I begin with thanking our chief guest, Mrs. Sulakshana Pramod Savant. As Sir said, we are always proud of her as our very own chemistry student, my student too. And she's the president of Goa State Women's Self-Help Group Association and many other important posts that she holds. She is a star. And ma'am made time to grace this occasion. We are very grateful and I thank ma'am for the same. Well, a public lecture with an eminent speaker and therefore a big audience. Dr. Shailish Naik, director of NIS, former secretary MOES government of India. Sir, we want to very much thank you for accepting to come 
to this place and enrich all our students. A lot of knowledge that you have given us and a very special lecture indeed. Thank you, sir. A gratitude to also the Secretary Education, Government of Goa, Sri Prasad Lolekar, who has always motivated us to go far and wide to spread knowledge and information. We're also grateful to the Director, Director of Higher Education, Mr. Bushan Savaikar, for his moral support. We have to also thank the Registrar of Goa University, Professor V.S. Nadkarni, as organizers of this special National Space Science Symposium in collaboration with ISRO. Professor Chandrasekhar Rivankar and team, we thank you for always being the bridge between the colleges and the higher educational institutions for coordinating such programs. And now, I come to our very own, our principal of Government College, Arts, Science and Commerce, Sankili, Professor Gervasio Mendes. Sir, you have always given us the opportunity to showcase such programs. And you have always shown us the way to indeed put up a good, well-organized program. We thank you, sir, for your moral support. I would also like to thank Vice Principal, Professor Sonia Sirsar, who I just saw her, as usual, going around for, we know what, a little discipline in the audience. I thank you, ma'am, for always being there for us. <clears throat> a special thank you to all heads of schools, present here and not present, heads of high secondary schools, colleges, especially for deputing your students here, without whom this lecture would have no meaning. I also thank all the teachers that are present here members of the public who have made it possible to find time and attend this program, which has surely been a very good lecture. I would also like to thank staff of Ravindra Bhavan, Sankili, your assistant to make this venue available for us is much appreciated. Also thank all the technicians here who have been able to uh, get the show running smoothly. And then we have the local organizing committee. I thank the program co coordinator, Dr. Sufala Pujari, who has been meticulously planning this talk with dedication and I also thank each and every member of this organizing team. I cannot name all of them, but we are very grateful to you to have organized such a lovely program. I cannot miss out those NCC students who have rendered help in ushering the students in this hall. Thank you. Well, last but not the least, we've had a young lady, Miss Alicia D'Souza, Assistant Professor in English of Government College, Sankili. And she carried the show very gracefully. What more can we say? Thank you, Alicia. And a big thank you to one 
and all be safe. Go home safely.